to the bottom of, of what is essentially a Russian invasion of Ukraine. You know, the Committee of Soldiers, uh, uh, Soldiers Mothers has been called a, a fifth column and, and branded traitors. Journalists who've been investigating the grave sites for dead, dead Russian soldiers come back from Donbass have been beaten up or intimidated. Putin is very good at sort of controlling the narrative, both internally and now indeed externally. And I think that's what's so interesting is that we're seeing a machine that was honed in Ukraine to a certain extent now being applied exactly. to Syria. All right, Michael, exactly. thank you. It's, it's, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. It's all, always very interesting. But so we're thankful to have you on, and there's always more than we have time for. So thank you until yeah. next time. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think what, what's so interesting about all of this is that, you know, we've had certain lessons that have been taught in Ukraine, you know, certain apparatus for controlling information or soldiers showing up in other countries that are starting to be applied in Syria, which is, I think, a good point. That he'd made. Definitely. Um, and, you know, part of this initiative that has shifted, you know, people are focusing a lot on the UN General Assembly, on Putin's speech that he's expected to give there, uh, and there's been a lot of hype with that. But the question is really what effect that's going to have. And we want to speak to our next uh, very special guest, Mikola uh, Gnatovsky. Gnatovsky, sorry, I struggle yes. when I get a little nervous. Yes. Everything that's else. That's name, <laughs> uh, So, Professor of International Law at Taras Shevchenko University here in Kiev. Kiev. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you. you know, you work a lot with international public law, but also with uh, human rights and humanitarian law going around it. With all this media focus on Putin and the speech, is there much expectation for, for change when it comes to Eastern Ukraine or more generally? Well, personally, my uh, expectations from the General Assembly are rather low. I would say that the United Nations itself is, is, is in a permanent crisis, but still it's, it's the only arrangement that has been possible to, to create since the Second World War, and, and any uh, attempts to reform it uh, have never really uh, bear, bore any fruit. So it was really difficult to, uh, to move forward from where we are. But at the same time, the General Assembly is an excellent place uh, to meet with states and to secure broader international support uh, for various countries. And that's exactly what Mr. Putin is going to do, and that's exactly what President Poroshenko is going to do. So basically, it's, it's, it's about you know, trying to find who are your friends and, and whom you need to work with more and to whom you need to explain your position better. Because uh, uh, it's surprisingly, as it, uh, surprising as it may seem to many people in Ukraine, uh, actually not so many uh, people uh, abroad, not so many decision makers abroad, are ready to accept uh, without any reservations uh, the, the side of Ukraine or even the side of Russia, even being their, their close lies. And uh, really you need to talk to people and you need to, uh, to explain because uh, you know, the, 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 the narrative that we hear from both from Russia and from uh, Ukraine, that, that's not necessarily so convincing for everyone. That's why it's a very interesting exercise in multilateral diplomacy, but hardly more than that. Uh, this week there was a very interesting development in eastern Ukraine. Uh, the UN was effectively kicked out of the occupied areas. Can you talk about what effects that, that's going to have going forward now? That's very sad and very worrying because, uh, of course, the United Nations uh, sh should not be seen as, 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 as a party to the conflict. And the United Nations, uh, of course, would, would like by uh, all costs to avoid such a situation. And uh, if they are kicked out of one of the, of the, of the of, you know, territories or parts of the territory, which are not under control of the Ukrainian government. That's a very sad development because basically who is, who is left on the ground from internationals, it's really you can't find that many. Uh, there's, of course, in the International Committee of the Red Cross. There's, of course, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Sans Frontières uh, and that's basically it. And that's, that, that's, very, that's very dangerous. And uh, that's also something that uh, should vary persons who, uh, and those, those people who are active in, 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 in human rights in Europe because, of course, uh, you know, extremely serious allegations and actually quite also clear information about uh, mass human rights violations in, in, in those uh, areas, they uh, would, uh, I mean, they, they already give rise to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of worrying from, from all over the place. And uh, if uh, the United Nations is not there, it means that there will be no one to basically to, to step in and to talk to, to the parties, except for the, let's say, for the ICRC, who have very special means and very special policy when they are on the ground in conflict zones. 
And you know, another issue we've looked at, and we have an infographic that we'll pull up, you know, uh, when it comes to the UN, the Security Council always plays a major role. And in recent years, Russia has been very active in using its veto, you know, blocking action on both Syria and Ukraine. Uh, and the concern with that is it keeps, you know, it makes it hard for the UN to be active in those fears. So if that road is blocked, what does that mean and what are the other avenues? There's been a lot of focus on the International Criminal Court, but after ICTY, focusing on the former Yugoslavia, there seems to be a lack of enthusiasm for those projects. Well, you see, when it comes to the United Nations, of course, the Security Council is the body which has the major responsibility for uh, international peace and security. And of course, if the, the Security Council is blocked because one of the permanent members uh, has, uh, well, let, let's, let's say diplomatically plays a very special role in, in, in the conflict, uh, that, that is, is extremely de deplorable because you, I mean, there's, there's of course the mechanism of uh, the so-called uniting for peace uh, resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. But first of all, it, it, it shouldn't be taken for granted that the General Assembly is going to pass such a resolution easily. And secondly, even if they do, uh, if, even, 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 even if the states agree, well, that uh, is, would not necessarily lead uh, to any tangible result. And when it comes to international criminal justice, you see, the difference between the, the events in the former Yugoslavia or, let's say, in Rwanda it, 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 and, and, and the current events is that now there's a permanent international criminal court. Back then, it was all very new, and basically the Security Council, without any vetoes, by the way, was able to uh, create a very innovative mechanism of, creating, of, of having those two international criminal tribunals. But there's one thing which varies me a lot when it comes to international criminal justice. If we look back at in 1993 and the situation in the former Yugoslavia, and next year, 1994, to Rwanda, in both cases, the uh, international criminal tribunals were created... Uh, simply, well, not simply because, but the major reason politically, as, as far as I understand, was because any attempts by the international community to somehow to stop the wars, to stop the war in Yugoslavia, to stop the, or prevent or stop the genocide in Rwanda, failed. And so it was, it was a kind of a sign of a, of, of a great failure. It was basically the, the declaration by the international community that both things, both battles are lost. And, and the only thing which, which remains is to create a, a mechanism at least for international criminal prosecution of persons responsible for, for grave human rights but violations. The key issue with that is the events were in the past and it's how you deal with it. Yeah. Or with active conflicts, it's different. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think we have to thank you for that. We sure. don't have as much time as we like, but very interesting to get your insight. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for talking. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Joining us via Skype is our own Natalia Humanyuk, who is in Paris. Uh, Natalia, what's the scene in Paris? What sort of reactions are you getting from the French about issues with Syria and Russia? There is a lot of anticipation of tomorrow's meeting of uh, Vladimir Putin with Barack Obama because Syria has a very, very tough position on Syria. There was this week meeting between the foreign ministers of France, Germany, United Kingdom and Federica Mogherini where there was a clear split between uh, France and Germany. Um, because uh, Angela Merkel recently mentioned that uh, there could be talks with Bashar al-Assad and Francois Hollande, the French president, with Frederica Merini and uh, uh, not the French president, but the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France, uh, mentioned that there is no way. For France, the position is that if there is any talks with a Syrian president, it's about his departure, it's about how he's leaving the, the power. So uh, France is uh, very much expecting how the uh, talk between Putin and Obama will take place. Well, it sounds and like France has the complete opposite position of Russia then, where Russia is insisting that Assad stays and France is insisting that he goes, along with the U.S. and other Western powers, correct? Yeah, it's absolutely correct. So there is this uh, division and uh, there are concerns how uh, Russia would play with these divisions. And it's also very much unclear what would be the position of the American president because even the uh, British uh, foreign secretary said that I would love to know what Putin will uh, say. Also, it has a very direct impact on the situation in Ukraine, probably not that much direct. But we know that right after the General Assembly, where Putin will meet with Obama, where there will be Ukrainian president, the French president, uh, all of them, all of the European leaders, they are coming back to Paris next Friday, and there will be the meeting in the Normandy format. Uh, Ukrainian President Poroshenko, Vladimir Putin, uh, then... Um, 
Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande. So they will discuss how the, uh, what would to do with Minsk. Uh, it's also very much unclear why this uh, meeting takes place now. In general, it's like to check the position, what will happen with the Minsk Accord, are they working? But definitely they would be directly influenced by the uh, results of the uh, Putin's meetings in uh, United Nations in New York. And since you have these two meetings so close together, I mean, is there, are you getting the sense that these two issues are packaged together? for European leaders that they want an agreement on Syria and an agreement on Ukraine at the same time? I've tried to really ask this question to as many people as possible uh, in France uh, with Germans and with the Americans. And everybody, at least the politi politician, try to say that these are two separate issues and that might be the chance that at least in Paris there is a consideration that Vladimir Putin is kind of losing in Ukraine so he tried to uh, come in front <coughs> with the Syrian initiative to be back on the international stage and also the meeting with the American president is a part of it. We also know that this week there was a meeting between the Defense Secretary of the United States and also the uh, Russian Minister for Foreign Affairs of uh, some kind of, co not cooperation, but discussion that, you know, the Russian military which are present in Syria and the Americans don't go directly, are not caught with any kind of uh, fight. So it's all connected, but uh, what I wasn't sure that it won't be discussed in one package. So that are still two separate issues and like in case in, in, of Iran, um, they wouldn't be discussed together, yet the impact of the uh, Russian comeback to the international scene is definitely mm. will matter for the uh, solution in and, Ukraine. And what's your sense, I mean, for the French, is this still mainly seen as a foreign issue? Has it become more important domestically with the refugees? I mean, they've also, you know, have intentions to be more militarily involved with the airstrikes, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that uh, domestically it's uh, not issue just about with the refugees because there are not that many coming to France, so there is a hot debate here. But Syria is a, there was once a French colony, it's a very tight um, connection. And also in 2013, if we would remember, French were really, really ready to start the, to launch the operation, and then the United States more or less cancelled. So still, this kind of separation and this not clear relation between the US and France over Syria um, could, could really... Well, I mean, in 2013, that was when Putin published this opinion piece in the New York Times, which is pivotal in changing Obama's position. So he's always been, you know, played a role in kind of ending action, especially against Assad, correct? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah it's correct. And really, in this case, this uh, division between the position of Germany, France, and the United States really matters because uh, for us as Ukrainians, it's, uh, for the Ukrainian side, it's uh, uh, worthy to watch how all this... Uh, how these sides would uh, cooperate. And of course, there is still the debate. Uh, is Russia the part of the solution or is it part of the problem? Uh, but obviously, Russia is involved. So um, the, the, can't get the, rid uh, of them completely. All right, well, we'll be looking forward to more updates with Putin's speech at the UN. And thank you so much. We'll also look forward to having you back in the studio as well. Thank you. All right. Well, we always get to have some interesting guests here, and we're happy when they come back. One of them this week was Ben Judah, who I know Christian met as well. And Ben was in Ukraine because he's just written a book, and it was translated to Ukrainian. So Fragile Empire about Putin, and what was always exciting for us is the fact that uh, he had presented it after it was published in English here, on um, the Ukrainian version of Ramadska, and that had led to it being published uh, in Ukrainian as well. He has another book on London coming out uh, called This is London. Uh, but we had a chance to talk with him about another one of his projects. He's done a lot of work about money laundering through London real estate, and we have that interview for you now. So joining us now is Ben Judah. Thanks for being here. Um, you've been doing a lot of work recently about money laundering through real estate in London. What is that and how does it work? One of the things that's really shocking in how corruption works is that coming out of Russia and Ukraine and all over the world, you have dirty black cash that's seeking a way to become nice, white, usable money. And the easiest way to do this is to buy property, not just in Britain, but Britain's a real capital for this. And the reason you can do this is that property in Britain can be purchased anonymously via an offshore company. So I could steal a vast amount of money from the Ukrainian HIV 
AIDS budget, create a company called Ben, register it in the Cayman Islands, that could then buy property in London anonymously. So money stolen from Ukraine has become, gone from dirty black cash to nice white cash. And that is happening on an industrial scale. It's, you have minimum of 100 billion laundered a year in, in London, according to British tax officials. And it's turned Victorian bricks. It's turned these sort of dusty old uh, bricks of London into the international currency of kleptocracy. And I've been kind of campaigning to highlight that and to kind of expose not only how it works, but also to stop it in a British political context. Well, you're also involved with a, a film about this, correct? Yes. Or... Um, I came up with uh, one of the idea, an idea for a film which was to take a sort of caricatural Russian crook, a sort of government minister who would go into uh, British um, properties in the company of estate agents and say, I've stolen this money from the Russian health budget, will you sell me this house? And surprise, surprise, uh, with secret cameras, uh, the people we approached all said yes. And this caused a big stir in the UK, it got the topic to be debated, and we had uh, two successes. One is that the British opposition has made ending anonymous purchases and ending uh, foreign entities being allowed to buy UK properties. That's a foreign company registered in the Cayman Islands, for example. It's going to make a campaign for the next election that if they win, they'll get the rid of that. The danger now is that there are endless shell companies, right? That it's well, one yes. company so, to another to another, so you have no idea who it actually So the is. Labour Party in Britain once has proposed, uh, it's not yet um, party policy, and unfortunately the party doesn't have a sort of strong electable chance. In the near future, they have made it so they would like to make it so no foreign company uh, no foreign company registered abroad would be able to buy property. You'd have to set up a British company to buy property or a British individual would be able to do it. So British law would apply. And one of the other successes we had is that the Prime Minister said that he was launching a consultation to end anonymous ownership of UK properties. So we've had a, a bit of success, but, but so far sort of nothing in terms of legislative change. Is there any muscle behind that consultation or that would just be an advisory council? Uh, the Prime Minister had a very bad week. Uh, revelations of his uh, youth have uh, been coming out and uh, that's somewhat clouded over the, the start of the political season in the UK and um, not yet sure okay. is the answer. And I mean you've spoken a bit about the interrelationship you know between western financial systems and what goes on in Ukraine and other you know post-communist countries or developing economies I and mean, what is that interrelationship for you? Well, something I find really fascinating is that in academic circles uh, people are always trying to work out like what was it that made Russian and Ukrainian oligarchic capitalism the way it is. What made these countries so corrupt? And the answers that are usually sort of paddled forward are the Soviet legacy or even the Tsarist legacy or sort of antique attitudes to the state. And I think this is, this all matters, that's all there, but there's also something else, which is Russia and Ukraine entered capitalism uh, in the era of offshore finance. And the Ukrainian and the Russian oligarchy would only have been possible with offshore finance existing uh, as it already was in the 1980s. And you have one story which I'm quite sort of fond of telling is when uh, Khodorkovsky came to London for the first time in the midst of the fall of the Soviet Union, and he asked if he could meet Mr. J.P. Morgan. These are people who didn't know what to do with large sums of money. And if it hadn't been a possibility that you could park, park vast sums of money anonymously offshore I do not think that the Russian or the Ukrainian states would have uh, emerged in the way they did. I would go as far to say that modern Russia and modern Ukraine are as much the creation of the British Virgin Islands and Switzerland and the Cayman Islands as they are of the post-Soviet legacy. And so what's been the reaction in particular to this project with London real estate? Because it seems to have taken something that wasn't a real political issue before. People were upset and made it kind of popular. Because you were making a point on Twitter saying, you know, this is the reason why you'll never be able to afford a house in London. Yes. What have you heard from people? What's the reaction been to all this? Well, um, with now there's greater awareness of it. And I, I think it's the beginning of uh, a long process towards change. Uh, the... I was pleased that the Labour Party has adopted it as a policy and the Prime Minister is now kind of discussing it uh, and has launched uh, the consultation. But I think there's a lot more to do and I think there's a lot for Ukrainians to do. Uh, something very important, I think, uh, 
for Ukrainians, not just politicians, not just diplomats, also individuals, is that when you meet people from Britain or Switzerland or Austria, is that you have to sort of confront them with this issue, which is that you're allowing your country and your real estate to be part of a looting machine, which is seeing HIV AIDS budgets, TV, TB budgets, and God knows what else besides, vanish from my country and impoverishing me. And I'd like to introduce a bit of shaming culture. Uh, for too long, embassies in Kiev have written back saying that this is happening, but there are no costs of it. And so it needs to be quantified. Exactly. All right, so now we want to take a closer look at Estonia. Uh, the recent event that's gained a lot of attention came on September 26, when there was an exchange of spies, uh, individuals who had been convicted, one in Russia, one in Estonia, of spying. Um, and this gained a lot of attention. It certainly looked a lot like the Cold War, with this sort of bridge exchange, people walking halfway out with their handlers and then exchanging. Uh, of course, this issue, particularly in Estonia, had gained a lot of attention before, because the Estonian security official, Estan Kover, uh, the official Estonian and EU position was that he was abducted from Estonian soil by the Russians, taken to Russia, accused of having entered Russia illegally, and spying for them. And the man that he was exchanged for is Alexei Dresen, who was a former Estonian intelligence security officer uh, who was actually charged with treason because in 2012 he was arrested while trying to board a flight in Tallinn to Moscow, and he was subsequently sentenced to 16 years in prison in Estonia for cooperating with Russia's intelligence service, the FSB. And now we want to get a little bit of the Estonian response on Skype. We have Akto Lobyakas, who is a columnist at Postimas. I hope I'm saying that all right. I know it's uh, Estonian and not so practiced at that. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the first question is, what has the Estonian reaction been to this exchange? I know with Essen Kober, it's been a big issue. Good evening. The overwhelming response here has been that of or one of relief, really. Uh, Koffer was gone for slightly more than a year. Estonia felt, didn't feel it's a, that isolated. There was a lot of international support, but it was a matter, clearly, where it was wholly dependent on the goodwill uh, of Russia. So essentially, Koffer's return, uh, I think, now returns us to a position where Estonia can, again, go back to, if not... Uh, square one in its relationship with Russia, but can proceed with proper nation-to-nation um, -nation contacts. The Estonian foreign minister uh, is meeting uh, her Russian counterpart later today in New York, uh, and we just, I think most of Estonia now hopes to put this all behind ourselves or themselves. Well, what's the analysis of the situation? Because uh, on the one hand, it could be seen as relations improving for the better, moving forward. On the other hand, it could just be seen as a cheap ploy ahead of Putin's you know, speech at the UN, trying to make it look like he's ready to move in a new direction when he may not be. I seriously doubt that this has anything to do with the Putin-Obama meeting. Uh, this, the, um, the procedural symmetry in what happened to uh, Koffler and Dressen is far too suggestive, I think, um, for, this, for, 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 for this international context to be a salient factor here. Both were, um, both were um, uh, given lengthy prison terms for fairly similarly defined offences, and the exchange, I think, was in the works uh, uh, quite a while ago, maybe six, seven months ago, there was first mention of it, uh, heard uh, uh, in Estonian media, then that quickly sort of dissipated, and now we have this exchange. The timing of it possibly could have been influenced by the meeting between Obama and uh, Putin, but I do think this was a bilateral thing between Estonia and Russia, and Russia, uh, for what it's worth, I think, uh, its main intention, main, main goal, was to uh, extract uh, Dresden. Uh, there is this, um, you know, this famous simile uh, applies to most large security services, never leave your own behind, and Dresden clearly was one of their own. Uh, and I think why Goffer had to spend a year in prison was for the court proceedings to run their course and him to be extradited, as he said, as a spy, exchanged for another spy, also, if one, um, I don't know if you've seen the um, scenes broadcast on Russian TV of the exchange itself that took place on the bridge, and there was 
there were references made to the Cold War. I think what Russia actually got out of it was the sense that at, at a certain level where it really matters, we are the same. We why the lost contact. No, we're still here. Christian, do you have another question or should we? So this it? really is not just a symbolic gesture. You, you think this is an indication that going forward, relations with Russia are going to be, are going to uh, gain strength? I think this could be read as a signal from Russia that it is going to do what, not exactly whatever it wants, but it's going to take, it's not going to be dictated terms too. I, I do think Koffer would never have been freed, no matter what size the international com campaign of support behind the, um, uh, behind the Estonian attempts to have him freed. I mean, everybody wearing uh, yellow ribbons and uh, we had ministers, we had uh, heads of state, uh, from Western Europe, uh, also from the States, I think, expressing support. I do think that Russia very clearly wanted to demonstrate that it is it that dictates the terms of these things, and Estonia, in a sense, um, just had to wait until, um, you know, constellation is right for, for an equal-looking exchange. And I, think, I do think Russia does, sort of milks it for what it's worth now, but um, the essence of it is, is, is it wants to indicate some sort of a Cold War style parity between the two systems, and Estonia is a convenient reference point for this. All right, well, on that note, I think we'll wrap up, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was nice to get an Estonian perspective there. Now, where we want to pivot now is to look at NATO. Uh, we had the NATO, uh, sorry, oh no, we had a different note that I went to look at, sorry. We had Jens Stoltenberg visiting Ukraine, who's the NATO. Secretary General. Uh, there are a lot of questions about how that measures up, where things are going. Uh, we have an interview from a little bit earlier from Wolfgang Ischinger of the Munich Security Conference when he gives his expectations about Ukraine and NATO and where that's moving. We wanted to show that now uh, and then we'll go into the topic a little bit more after that. So you mentioned that it's very important for the Western or European partners of Ukraine really to mention that they would support as much as possible and then the Wall Street and the others would, you know, trust, invest. But who should really and in what form clearly state that? Because there are a lot of talks of support. I think, and how different it would be. I think the appropriate forum for such a formal policy statement of you know, sustained support for Ukraine should come from the European Council, the president of which happens to be from Poland, President Tusk. So I think that's uh, the business of the European Council, to make a formal policy declaration uh, and to declare that this is one of the foreign policy objectives which the European Union, meaning the Commission and the Council and the Parliament, will, uh, will pursue jointly. And um, you've mentioned that it's really not in the nearest future for Ukraine to join NATO, but clearly what should be and what could be this policy for the countries which are not member allies, while the, uh, those countries don't feel that they are behind and or they have at least some goal. I mean, if you speak like feasibly, because the general words of support and cooperation after some time also not really taken seriously. Well, you raise, this is a very difficult question, and I have great sympathy for uh, the countries who uh, have not been able to join NATO in the past and for whom there may not now be an easy way into NATO. Because, you see, joining NATO requires two things. It requires that the country that wants to join NATO is going to be united, domestically speaking, in its determination to join NATO. That is not probably true in the case of Ukraine. You have some parts of your country that have, a, that have a problem. So we would be dividing Ukraine even more than it is by raising the question. The second problem is uh, all the members of NATO, all the members of NATO must be willing to defend Ukraine in case of a conflict. That is not so easy. We had a very hard time in the initial NATO enlargement round. Would we all agree to defend Poland? It wasn't so easy to answer. And I can tell you that at this moment, 
you would not have a consensus among all the members of NATO to defend Ukraine. Therefore, there will not be an invitation by NATO because it needs to have consensus. There will not be an invitation issued anytime soon to Ukraine. Let's be realistic. That is the situation. One can say this is terrible, but this is the fact. So now we're being joined by Alexander Hara, uh, who's a Ukrainian diplomat and expert at Maidan of Foreign Affairs. There's been a lot of talk about NATO this week. Can we expect much action from this most recent meeting? What's the progress with NATO at this point? Yeah, sure. sure. First of all, we are looking forward to more actions uh, on the part of NATO as well. Uh, so uh, Secretary General was here and there was the signing of uh, two MOUs with, with Ukraine that uh, allowed us to get uh, access to the uh, trust funds and uh, the most important uh, funds uh, related to command control and computers and then uh, to logistics. So the, the weakest points of our uh, defense machine that we need to meant uh, not just to uh, withstand the aggression from Russian side, but uh, to prepare ourselves to be ready to join NATO. And in your opinion, how ready is Ukraine to join NATO? Well, uh, certainly we are not ready uh, at the moment, but uh, there is a uh, huge support from the public. Uh, we've got something like 30 or 64 percent of... Uh, and that, that support has grown exponentially uh, yeah. over the last and few it's, years. And it's obviously, uh, if uh, there is an ex escalation in the East, uh, this uh, support will grow so even bigger. And the second thing, uh, if people uh, understand that uh, NATO is not just about the military things, it's about uh, democracy and other stuff, uh, uh, related to the the day-to-day -day activities, uh, the support will grow as well. Right, and uh, I believe I read that Ukraine has only uh, uh, there's a checklist essentially of 1,300 or 1,400 uh, standards that, that the country has to meet in order to join NATO, and Ukraine's only actually completed three of those, I believe. Well, I'm not sure about the exact number, but if we have a look at the history of uh, NATO. Uh, Turkey or Greece was not ready uh, to become a member, but it became a member because of the political reasons. And there is a huge uh, amount of things uh, to consider uh, for NATO countries to include uh, Ukraine to the, this club. And first and foremost, uh, certainly the strategic uh, considering, uh, Ukraine and Poland is the center of gravity on the continent. Without accommodating our uh, security, uh, legitimate security concerns, there is no possible uh, way to uh, ensure security on the whole continent. That's one thing. Second thing, if we are in the, uh, well, uh, the West is leaving us in the grey shadow of uh, Russia, uh, we will uh, be um, slightly or we would be um, uh, attracted in, into the geopolitical orbit of, uh, of Russia. So uh, I, I don't think that uh, in the West and especially in Washington and the United Kingdom and other uh, countries who, uh, whose uh, elite is thinking more strategically will be happy uh, to have uh, Russia strengthened by Ukraine and to, uh, to, to, in, in, you know, to infuriate uh, the Baltic states, uh, Poland and uh, mm -hmm. some uh, southern countries, uh, because if, if Ukraine fails, uh, these countries will be in danger and they, they, they're asking the, uh, Brussels to, to, to help them. But I want to talk about the transition because where we've seen a major transition is in terms of public support within Ukraine for joining NATO. Um, we'll have an infographic we'll put up. But, you know, the most recent polls show that going up to 66 percent, where in the past, you know, it's been very low, I think even single digits previously under Yanukovych, um, or 20 percent, fine, uh, lower, much, much lower. And so the interesting issue is as, you know, this fighting has gone on and this uh, kind of battles have gone on, public support has grown. We've seen wider uh, support of politicians, the public support being key because what Poroshenko had committed himself to and many of the other parties is that when it came time they would put the issue to a referendum. So having a majority of Ukrainians in favor is certainly important and with this expansion what you're mentioning is since the collapse of communism, you know, we've seen NATO move into Eastern Europe, into Poland, into the Baltic states, uh, becoming, you know, kind of ensuring these countries security in a way that Ukraine doesn't have that. But the big question seems to be whether or not the actual 
usual process of joining other issues with uh, purchasing of equipment or weapons uh, that make it less likely for NATO to, you know, to bring Ukraine in. Though the largest issue, of course, is fighting in the East, and in particular, kind of Western European countries don't want to put themselves at risk for that. So, I mean, it seems like there's also a, a PR factor of this, or having to be able to sell it, which plays a key role. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, I would, say, would disagree with you that NATO is expanding to east. It's east, eastern central uh, European countries are trying to get uh, to NATO, or they, they got to NATO, so it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, NATO is based on the open door policy, and fortunately, uh, in uh, uh, Bucharest summit, uh, we got this uh, door, uh, open door policy uh, option uh, for, for Ukraine and Georgia. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't get uh, the MEP, and uh, it was one of the reasons why uh, Russia decided to, to uh, occupy part of the territory of Georgia and then uh, Ukraine, because it was a weak decision uh, of, of NATO. Uh, and uh, if uh, there is such a postponement of our uh, preparation for NATO, I mean formal, it will be uh, it will have the same effect uh, once again. Uh, with regard to the, you know, our preparation in terms of uh, weaponry and other stuff, uh, so there is no reason uh, to, to, to buy the high uh, sophisticated equipment at the moment because we, we know that uh, uh, Eastern European countries, the Baltics and uh, Black Sea countries uh, have, have uh, the Soviet uh, weaponry at, at their disposal mm -hmm. and there is no contradiction to, uh, with NATO standards. So NATO standards that's not just because uh, they're not just related to the technical stuff. They're related to interoperability uh, and other stuff that uh, um, gives them opportunity to, to, to be part of the NATO structure. To work together and be on the same so, level. So there is no uh, big problem with our mm -hmm. uh, standards at the moment. Uh, is the, the issue is uh, building a new defense machine, uh, the new logistic, uh, the, the new uh, way of thinking about the defense. Mm -hmm. So joining us on the line now from Washington is Michael Sassir, who is Skyping in. And Michael is a uh, Black Sea and Eurasia analyst who has recently written a foreign policy report on the possibility of Georgia actually joining NATO as well and how it's getting the runaround. Michael, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Can you talk about what has happened with Georgia and if you sort of anticipate that Ukraine will effectively get the same runaround? To put it briefly, uh, Georgia has done a very good job of meeting and in many cases exceeding the standards that have uh, been put before it in terms of uh, integration into Euro-Atlantic structures and, and specifically NATO. Uh, Georgia to this point has received a promise uh, along with Ukraine in 2008 to, uh, to eventually accede to the alliance. Uh, it has an annual national program. There's an ongoing and very, uh, very robust uh, Georgia-NATO uh, commission uh, that meets regularly. There's a large NATO uh, NATO, NATO presence on the ground in Tbilisi, and recently they inaugurated a, a new joint training and education center uh, that will train Georgian and NATO member troops uh, for, for uh, pre-deployment purposes. Uh, and obviously there's been a lot of uh, Georgian participation in NATO and Western uh, deployments throughout the world, uh, most famously in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq. Uh, Kosovo and Central African Republic with the EU mission there. So Georgia has done uh, quite a bit um, on its defense side, on its uh, political side, uh, to prepare itself for NATO membership, but has never really received uh, what it what it covets, which is a, a concrete pathway uh, into into the alliance. And but to ask uh, the difficult a, question, Michael, is the yeah. is NATO just leading these countries on? I don't think that the NATO. First of all, we can't speak of it in terms of NATO as a monolithic entity because NATO is an alliance made up of its members, and its member states ultimately have the say uh, over who, who comes in and, um, at, and at what point they do. Uh, so it's, in terms of NATO itself, uh, what we see is a, a, a uh, organizational infrastructure that is very much uh, well partnered with the Georgians, well partnered increasingly with Ukraine as well. Uh, and, and seems to have very good relations with the militaries of both these countries. Uh, but the member states, there's, there are political misgivings um, among certain states. And th they may even be a minority, but all it takes is really just one country saying, no, we're not going to, we're not going to stand for it. Unfortunately, it's not just one country. It's a number of countries, um, primarily in Europe. And so it's, it's turned into this self-perpetuating cycle of, well, if 
George, if the Europeans are going to be against it, then the U.S. isn't going to lead on it, and, uh, and, and if the U.S. is going to lead on it, then uh, certain European states aren't going to press for it, aren't going to go along with it. So it's, uh, it, it's really turned into this, this almost farcical uh, cycle of, of, of passing the buck around about who's going to take the lead on resolving the Georgia issue. And I think that's, a, that's an open question on how and to what extent it will be resolved. All right. Thank you so much. I mean, I think to a certain extent, you know, Georgia is seen as a model for Ukraine. It is a little farther along with some of these processes. Do Ukrainians look to Georgia for what could be done with NATO or how, how does that example work here? Well, we've got a, a, a bit uh, bigger size. Uh, we should sure be in mind that we are a little the bit biggest bigger. <laughs> country in Europe, uh, uh, after all. Um, but uh, certainly we should have a look at the Georgian uh, experience. Uh, but from the other hand, uh, we, we just, uh, we're in, in unique position, uh, one thing. The second thing, we need to first and foremost to work uh, not just in Ukraine, but uh, with our Western partners, uh, because there is a uh, reluctance in thinking, and unfortunately, even with the military establishment, uh, because there is no such a thing like Ukrainian problem or Georgian problem or issue. There is a problem of Russia. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there is no um, policy towards Russia so far. Uh, NATO decided at the World Summit to strengthen its uh, northern and uh, uh, south southern flank. Uh with additional uh, military equipment, with additional centers and logistic support, but uh, they didn't come up with any idea what to do with Russia. So, uh, so that issue continues to be the one it, it, linking in all these cases absolutely, together. Absolutely. All right. the, the we'll key have to cut you off there, but thank you mm -hmm. so much. Uh, we want to go back to our interview with Wolfgang Ischinger, the chairman of the Munich Security Conference now. Uh, so what do you think? Is it something, a path to find a new status quo? Or is it trying to reverse uh, that damage that uh, already been done to, to Europe? Well, look, there are short-term answers, there are medium-term issues, and there are long-term issues. Let me start with the short-term issue. We have a total breakdown of trust at the moment not only because of Ukraine, but mostly because of the crisis in and around Ukraine between NATO and Russia. Russian airplanes fly without transponders over crowded airspace. Uh, accidents may happen any moment. So the first short-term measure, which I believe uh, should be proposed right now, is for NATO and Russia to agree uh, to exercise mutual restraint as they do their uh, military exercises, etc. The future of European security, the future of Ukrainian security, is not just a military question. I hope Ukrainians understand that the best way to take Ukrainian security forward and to resolve the problem of uh, Eastern Ukraine is by demonstrating that Ukraine can do it can um, extricate itself from corruption, can create growth, etc. And for that, Ukraine needs help. The, the European Union should um, make a formal statement like Mario Draghi did on the Euro crisis and should declare that the EU will do everything it can to help Ukraine move beyond this crisis into sustainable growth and into, um, uh, you know, more economic and financial security. What we need, of course, is to re-establish a process that will allow the United States, the Russian Federation, the European Union, Ukraine and others to actually talk and consider whether they accept and whether they're prepared to reaffirm the principles of European security, which we agreed 25 years ago in the Charter of Paris. There is no single uh, easy answer out of the current really serious historic crisis. Don't you think that uh, everyone should start with fixing the Crimea issue first? Because at this conference, a lot of people are saying that Crimea and the lack of reaction from the international community to uh, when in the annexation happened uh, kind of uh, encouraged Russia to proceed with a uh, falling aggression. And now to fix Crimea issue is the first step to fix the whole mess. Well, I will be the first to say uh, we 
the West deserves to be blamed for a for a not sufficiently strong reaction when it happened. Uh, I don't think that if we want to be realistic, there is going to be a shortcut way out of this issue. In other words, my approach to, to the Crimea issue is the approach which we took for many, many years when the Baltic countries were occupied by the Soviet Union then. We did not recognize this annexation and occupation, and it took a while, but now these countries are free again. So in the case of, the, of Crimea, I understand that for Ukrainians this is intolerable, but let's also be clear that diplomacy is not, doesn't perform miracles. We need to start with the things that are doable now, and Crimea is not doable now. Alright, so with that we have the setup for our next topic where we want to look at Crimea, specifically the blockade of Crimea. Um, we have to quantify that a little bit, so we have uh, an infographic that we pulled out that you can see there. Uh, and so you have certain roadblocks that have been set up on key roads moving into Crimea. As it is, it's still the case that a lot of goods and especially food and foodstuffs travels from Ukraine into Crimea. And uh, we've seen Crimean Tatar organizations, along with other organizations, have been involved, such as uh, Pravi Sector and some Ukrainian MPs. And what they've been doing is they've been blocking these shipments from going into Crimea. Not a total blockade, other people are able to enter, but these trucks that are transporting goods and foods have not. Uh, to a certain extent, this is a tool that is a race against time. Russia has committed itself to building a bridge across the Kerch Strait. Uh, so we have an image of that now where you can see that. The lower part of the image shows, you know, the construction that has been going on uh, as of September to try and finish that. So as long as that bridge isn't complete, the transport links to Crimea are very much dependent on roads going through Ukraine. We wanted to examine this issue a little bit more closely, what it means, uh, how it was motivated, and what people hope to achieve. To that extent, I'm very happy to welcome back to the program Arsen Jumadilov, an analyst at the Crimean Institute for Strategic Studies. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. Why is this happening, and what's the goal? Here. Well, uh, why is this happening? I think that is very much clear because we have uh, Crimea which is annexed. We, uh, as the whole world, we, uh, we believe that it has been done in an illegal way, in an illegal way, and uh, we believe that, uh, what, that support of this annexation whatsoever is uh, just not possible. It should not be there. So, what's and now it actually it should have uh, it, sh it should have taken place uh, one and a half year ago right after the annexation in april 2014 but it seemed that at that time the ukrainian government or the or the ukrainian state as a whole was uh, way too weak and it was way too much preoccupied with what was happening uh, at that time in donbas so it took well, the Ukrainian government has been kept reacting to what's going on. It's all been fast, it's been Absolutely. hard to do that. And what's interesting with the blockade um, is that it's not a government blockade. It's not the Ukrainian government right. saying you can't send things in. It's organizations taking action. And in particular for the Crimean Tatars, this is a protest that if they tried to do it on the other side of this de facto border, they wouldn't be allowed to, correct? Absolutely correct, yes. And uh, it is, to some, uh, to some extent, it is unfortunate that our government is uh, not prepared to... To, to make a, a swift action, to, uh, to take a swift action uh, on Crimea because they, uh, they are, as I say, too much preoccupied with, with Donbass. But this, uh, this reason, it, it, uh, it held for too long now. And so now it should change. And uh, now the, the civic society organizations being led by the majlis of the Crimean Tatar people, uh, they did take they did take the, the responsibility to uh, stop the shipment of the goods that are flowing easily, that w w were flowing easily to Crimea for so long. And as we know, 80% of these goods, they were not utilized, they, would not, they uh, were not consumed in Crimea. They were uh, re-transported or, or re-exported to, to mainland Russia. And so this, people were making money off of this? Absolutely. Then. They're making money, one. Second, uh, their fairy tales about uh, that sanctions uh, do, do not affect them, uh, it is just uh, not true. Why? Because they were so much eager 
to uh, to secure the shipment from Ukraine. In this way, they were, uh, to some extent, they were easing the pressure that the world, you know, put on them with all the the sanctions that they have. So, um, at this point of time, we believe that uh, this is a very much uh, a very long expected move. It is a very much. Uh, it is supported uh, by the public. It is also supported uh, by the president and the government, who said that yes, probably this is a good thing to happen. It is just unfortunate that uh, we see the initiative not, you know, coming out from uh, fr from official Kiev, but rather from. Uh, civic society organizations. And it's an interesting dynamic because what's, what's always struck me about the Crimean Tatars is they're very into um, kind of, um, well, techniques that in a way were used by the civil rights movement, movement in the U.S., you know, um, occupying something or blocking trucks coming th through. It's not aggressive, but it has an effect. It's moving forward. Right. It's trying to bring awareness to an issue uh, in a way that's nonviolent. But uh, to some of our viewers and to some writers, you know, there's been concern for what looks like something that has right sector or right wing group working together with the Crimean Tatars. I mean, is it true that they're working together or are they simply having similar goals? What is that? situation like? Well, I was there a few days ago, and what I saw is that, uh, first of all, it is not aggressive, absolutely, not at all. Uh, second, yes, there are some right-wing organizations there who, who supported the Crimean Tatars in their cause, but as the chairman of the Majlis, uh, Mr. Chubarov, said, uh, that whoever supports our cause and whoever, uh, whoever commits it in a peaceful way, in a non-violent way, they are welcome. Uh, to uh, support the blockade. So, uh, yes, to some extent, probably by, uh, especially uh, by the Russian media, this uh, could be used as a, as a motive to say that, oh, look, they are in a, in a close contact with, uh, with, with right-wing organizations. But in reality, uh, this is uh, not the fact. In fact, what we are having is that we are having an open platform for, for everybody who supports the idea that Ukraine should be integral, that the annexation of Crimea is illegal, that uh, all the crimes that are committed by the Russian regime in Crimea should, uh, uh, should be punished, or uh, we should have like our answer retaliation to what they do there in, in Crimea. So it is an open platform uh, which is accessible for, for everybody. What has been the Russian response so far to the blockade? Well, it has uh, been uh, to some extent comic, to some extent ridiculous. Why? Because uh, what they did is that uh, on the second day after the blockade started, they went down to shopping malls in Simferopol in Crimea. Uh, you know, showing that all the shelves are full, that they have food stuff, they have, you know, whatever. But uh, the problem with this is that you have your stocks full and they will be exhausted in two weeks. So we'll see the pictures in two weeks and they will be, uh, it will be a stark, you know, contrast uh, from what they showed a few days ago with what uh, we will see in a few weeks time. So they are trying to, to create a, an image as if uh, it is, it has a minor effect, and it will uh, not make an impact on the situation. Well, in they're Crimea. trying to put a, a strong face on saying this doesn't Absolutely. affect us. This has yes. had no impact. But I, I mean, I think you know there is an impact. And my question would be, if if this moves forward, if it goes on for a long period of time, there would be shortages that right. would also hurt the Crimean Tatar community. Right. And there are some in Ukraine who also complain, you know, that they've you know they have their goods, their food, their vegetables that they've grown, and you know they have legal papers from the government, and they're not able to get it to the market markets that they would normally. I mean, how would you respond to those two questions? I would say, as our leaders say, it is a trade made on blood, all right? So whoever is fine with an idea that uh, whatever he sells has blood stains on it, let him, you know, push forward his course. We will hear uh, from them and uh, we will have an open dialogue with them. But uh, up to today, we haven't heard a single voice being made by those in Ukraine who have a reputation of being honest, being straight, you know, uh, uh, being distinct uh, human rights, f uh, for example, fighters, uh, human rights activists, who would say that this is totally incorrect, this is 
totally wrong. You should lift the blockade and you should let the goods flow to Crimea. So, so this is first. Second, yes, if this si uh, situation, uh, if this lasts uh, for some time more, then of course we uh, have to institu we have to institutionalize this. We cannot let just the civic society organizations to uh, rule the situation. Why? Because to some extent, yes, it is effective and efficient, but uh, in the long run, they will run out of their resources, and it will probably create some uh, unease with the government, because uh, the government or the state is the one who should control its borders, right? And should Has there been things? the willingness to, to have that sort of integration yet? Or? Yes, what we have uh, seen so far is that the government says, yes, uh, we are closely watching the situation, we will see how it makes an impact on the situation in Crimea. And uh, to some extent, it proved a bit reluctant, but we see that with the public support growing and with this blockade uh, proving being effective, uh, they will have to make a step forward saying like, yes, all right, let us now do this, this and that. For example, let, uh, let us abolish the law on the uh, free economic zone of Crimea. Let us put instead um, uh, put forward a new law instead where we will say that all the goods that are uh, uh, that are transported in, uh, to Crimea uh, should be or, or sh should bear a humanitarian value for our citizens only for example foodstuff for kids or something like that uh, so we should see a legal action and we should see an action on the ground and these civil society organizations being replaced by the customs and and So we're looking for offices. increased coordination with the government and for them right. to play a part with yes. that. All right, In, we'll have to end it yeah. there. But I mean, I think that's a good note to focus on. Uh, now that we want to turn to a video that one of our correspondents had shot uh, with some Ukrainian politicians who'd gone to the blockade and the reactions of some of the people trying to get through. Ми зараз хлопців виставляємо. Почекай, ще 5 хвилин і вже тоді їдемо. Знаєш, що ми... там багато спокійніше. Там? Та там взагалі нормально, там собі збутаємо. Фури розвертаються, розвертається, приходять, щось там поговорили. Тут прийшла якась бабка-провокатор, що почала піднімати бучу, тут тих всіх збурювати. Пояснюємо, що не проїдете. Вони починають ну, Там свої бабки. Там батальйон Хрисон стоїть, тут батальйон Хрисон стоїть. Нам свої бабки потрібні. Там бас Привітайся з глядачами громадського. Ми ні одного не бачили, ні депутата. Еліта нова. Це Семенченко, це депутат. Да, вона така чорна. Семенченко, не парасюк, що не пройшов член. Не парасюк депутат. А вона Семенченко. Він даже до народу не підійшов, не пішов, не подорожав. А ми бидла. Правильно, вони наші за людей. Ми бидла. Ось у люди, а ми бидла. Жена Парасюка говорит, сколько вам заплатили? Вы про российские, это само российские засланцы, это само диверсанты типа могут. Нас, вот документы, подивитесь, у нас документы. Вот 18 числа сделаны, не с 20 числа. Вы, вы покажите, так, пускай, а это вы пишите сними. документы, чтобы показать кому? А по той же, причем про... думаете, что я провокатор? Парасюку. Кто, Парасюк? Да, что я провокатор, представляешь, а? Что они подкуплены? У меня 20 гектаров своей земли, если бы я лично картошка выращена, куда мне идеваться? Для продажі, все, а, всі документи є. Парасюк говорить, що документи не дійсні. Він що, метник? All right, that's the end of our program. Thank you so much for joining us, and tune in next time for another edition of The Sunday Show. Good night.